So our next panel is uh, Steve Ratner and Van Jones on economic inequality. Uh, and Steve Ratner is first and foremost, in our view, a board member of New America. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he is also the chairman of Willett Advisors uh, and was formerly the advisor to the presidential task force uh, on the auto industry in 2009. He is a contributing writer uh, for the New York Times op-ed uh, section. You see his columns regularly. He's also the economic analyst uh, for MSNBC's Morning Joe. Uh, and he's the author, uh, most recently, of Overhaul, an insider's account of the Obama administration's emergency rescue of the auto industry. Uh, so Steve is going to uh, show us some slides, and then he's going to be in conversation with Van Jones, uh, known to all of you uh, as the host of CNN's Crossfire, uh, president and co-founder of Rebuild the Dream. Uh, and uh, last time I saw you actually was uh, at the Democratic Convention in 2008. Uh, he, uh, Van Jones, has he's an author. He's written two New York Times bestsellers. Uh, and uh, he was also the green jobs advisor uh, to the Obama administration. Administration. So we're going to have a lively conversation on economic inequality. Um, thanks very much, Anne Marie. I uh, I didn't bring any lawyer jokes with me. I'm um, I'm not a distinguished member of the Senate, a, a great war hero, a former presidential candidate, but I did bring 30 PowerPoint slides, and so. <laughs> I am going to try to get through these in 20 minutes uh, and leave time to talk with Van and, and anyone else here who wants to uh, talk. So the first thing probably some of you are wondering is, given my background that Anne-Marie um, went through, and when you said I was most recently the author of a whole human plot, I wrote other books, which I never did, so I only got one book. Um, what am I doing up here? And uh, the answer uh, to that is this is an issue that I have uh, cared about for a long time, and just to both establish my, make sure this is working, my qualifications and also um, give you a sense of how long ago this all began and in a way how quaint it was that back in 1995 I wrote a piece, make sure my pointer's working, yeah. there it is. Uh, back in 1995 I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal on this issue um, and the one historical footnote I would add to that is that the editor, who, I was astonished they published it, um, uh, the editor who published it was a young editor who's now gone on to some other things and his name was David Brooks, so oh. there we are. <laughs> Now, since then, a lot has been written on this subject. Oops. Since then, a lot has been written on this subject, and most recently, as probably everybody here knows, a book that I think will go on in history as a seminal work in this area uh, was written called Capital. It was published about six weeks ago. It was published by an imprint of the Harvard University Press. It was written in French and then translated into English. It's 700 pages along with footnotes. Uh, but it became an instant bestseller, and it has been number one or number two on Amazon's uh, bestseller list since it came out. Uh, this is number three on the New York Times' list last week, probably headed uh, higher from there, very hard to get. But the question is how many people have read it, because if you read it, you would have learned some important things like this. You would have learned what the equilibrium wealth to annual income ratio is. You would have learned the inherited share of wealth and you would have learned the equilibrium share of income from wealth to total income. So I won't embarrass anyone here by asking how many <laughs> bought it, how many have read it, but, um, but the point is it has made a huge impact and it has really changed the debate in today's Washington Post. Chuck Lane has an interesting column on it pretty much every day. Someone writes something um, interesting on this, uh, uh, on this subject because of what this book has done. But it, and it touched a nerve, obviously, and it got people even more focused on an issue that has been uh, something a number of us have been thinking about for a long time. So what I want to do is use some of what Mr. Piketty and his partner, Mr. Saez, as well as other economists have done over the years uh, in this area to try to illustrate the problem, the causes, and maybe some of the solutions. So let me start with this slide, which may seem familiar, may be familiar to a lot of you. It's a pretty basic slide that uh, Piketty and Saez, his partner, did uh, some years ago using U.S. income tax data. And so what it shows at the bottom is the famous 1%, the red line. And to be in the 1% in 2012, you needed to have at least $370,000 of income, uh, average income of $441,000. And you can see that if you go all the way back to uh, 1913, and this is, as I said, based on income tax data, so uh, that's essentially when the income tax started, you can see that the share that this group has is essentially back to where it was during the Roaring Twenties. And again, probably something many of you have seen before. Um, I'm sorry, if you look, that's the green line. If you look at the red line down below, 
That is the top 0.01%. That is the 16,000 households with the highest income. And to be in that group of 16,000 in 2012, you needed to have a little over $7 million of income and $21 uh, million of average income. And again, you can see that that uh, group as well has gotten back to and even exceeded where it was at any point in our history. So this has been known and talked about for some time, this data. <coughs> um, but here's something that is new in this book from uh, some of what we saw before. This is wealth. And so wealth is much harder to analyze. And there have been questions about exactly how accurate the state is. But I think directionally, it shows the point. And so if you look at the US, and I am going to turn to Europe and some other parts of the world in a minute. If you look at just the US, you can see that, in fact, wealth is much more unequal than income. The famous 1% has, as we saw a minute ago, 17.4% uh, of the income. That was in 2010. Uh, and it has about 34% of the wealth, so roughly double. Um, what's all, what is sort of interesting to see is that while, while the income um, while the income uh, number has gotten back to where it was back in the, uh, in the Roaring Twenties or the Gilded Age, whatever you want to call it, wealth has not. And that's basically a function of the fact that we have, uh, going back that hundred years, instituted uh, a lot of progressive taxation, uh, state taxes, income taxes, and so on, which have uh, reduced the extent of the wealth concentration uh, from what it was back then. So an interesting little uh, <coughs> detail. Now, if you take the, one, the, the top 1%, I want to just focus for a minute on the top 1%, and I want you to look at the bottom, the bottom bar here. And, if you, and so this is a decomposition of the 1%. So this light gray area on the left is the bottom half of the 1%, so from 1% up to 0.5%. The black part is from 0.5 to 0.1%. The green is from 0.1 to 0.01, moving up. And the red is just that same 0.01%, those same 16,000 people, that households that we talked about before. <coughs> and so what's interesting about it is if you look at the light gray line in the middle, you can see that, in fact, the share of wealth of the top 1% of the people between 1% and 0.5%, in fact, hasn't really gone up at all since 1960, actually gone down slightly. If you look at the next group up, the black line, from 0.5 to 0.1, you see essentially the same thing. It's only when you get to the point one and above that you start to see this acceleration of concentration, and you see it most dramatically at the 0.01%, which is that red line. So back in 1975, that 0.01% had a little over 2% of the wealth. Today it has around 11% of the wealth. And it's, so that's an interesting aspect of what is going on out there. Now, let me turn a little bit uh, internationally. I'm going to kind of go back and forth between international comparisons and uh, US data. So uh, this compares the US to a bunch of uh, both developed and uh, developing countries around the world. And based on this particular type of data, you can see that the US has the highest share of income inequality. Uh, the 1 percent has the highest share of income of any uh, major country in the world, including India and China. Um, for those of you who are uh, devotees of this, uh, I want to make sure that I acknowledge there is other data that shows that China and India may be more unequal than we are by a little bit, but directionally we are in the same zip code and certainly, um, uh, for better or worse, a leader in accomplishing income inequality. Now, let me take the, uh, the chart that I showed you at the beginning and superimpose some other countries on it. So the red line is the, is the U.S. It's the 1% goes through 2010, gets to the 17.4% figure, and it compares it to three other countries, the UK, the blue line, uh, as well as France and Sweden. And you can see a divergence in what's happened, that while all four of these countries had fairly similar levels of income inequality 100 years ago, in recent years, the US and the UK have pulled away, <coughs> France and Sweden uh, much less so. And if you put a bunch more countries in here, which I didn't do because it would make it very hard to read, you would, um, you would essentially see the same kind of trend that the English-speaking world, if you want to call it that, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, places like that, have moved one way, and the non-English-speaking world have had much lesser uh, increases in income inequality. And we can, we can talk about uh, why it is, but it's, I think, heavily a function of uh, tax policies, regulatory policies, and things like that. 
Now, let's talk about uh, wealth inequality, looking again at a few different countries. So starting on, this goes back actually 200 years, this data. So how many people here are Jane Austen fans? And how many people are Downton Abbey fans? A lot of Downton Abbey fans. So, so if you're a Downton Abbey fan, we'll start with you guys. You can see that about the time that Downton Abbey uh, was set, 1% of the British population controlled nearly 70% of the wealth. If you look at back at the time of Jane Austen, it was sort of in the 55 or 60% range. And oddly enough, it wasn't that different in Sweden, of all places. But then you can see what happened. Uh, and this was a mix of tax policies, and it was also wars and depressions, and a lot of things that destroyed a lot of wealth, as well as wealth getting broken up into more hands as, um, as generations passed. But you can see that it came down for all of these countries. But Britain uh, came down, they all crossed the US right here in about 1960. And so today, we actually have a higher share of wealth concentration than Britain, than France, and then Sweden. Not back to these levels, of course, but still, uh, we are now the leaders. And one of the ironies of this, of course, is the US, I think we all think of the US as a country that was founded on this progressive uh, uh, anti-establishment, people can get ahead kind of idea, and we were that way for much of our history. All through the 19th century, we did not have this kind of level of wealth concentration, but today we are the country that in a way, and I'll show you some other data in a minute, has, uh, has, has the greater concentration of wealth, the greater, um, the greater ability for people to accumulate wealth and to keep it. Now, I think that some of what we've all seen happening with the debate about income inequality and, the, uh, and the, the real outrage, I guess, for lack of a better word, about income inequality would probably not exist, probably not exist to the same extent if all the boats were rising. If it weren't just the top that were doing better, but people across society were doing better, you might be hearing a little bit less about why do the people at the very top have so much, but that's not what's happening. So this uh, slide compares the U.S. to, again, uh, a bunch of countries. If you pick more countries, you'd find the same thing. And it looks at what's happened to real, meaning after adjustment for inflation, median incomes in these various countries. And so you can see that between 2000 and 2010, there was essentially no change in the U.S. median family income. But you can see what was happening in all these other countries, uh, including Canada and Britain, very large changes. Now, some of you may say, well, yeah, but they started from a much lower base. They're not as, they're, their incomes aren't as high as ours, so there was a lot of catching up to do, whatever. That is all true, but you will see that they have started to catch up. And in fact, Canada, and this is as of 2010, so I think most of us would guess that if you had data from now, you would find that Canada was actually ahead of us, but, they hit, but Canada has caught up to us. And so this is the amount of income uh, after taxes, you can think of it as disposable income that the average person, average per capita, that the average person has in each of these countries. So $18,700 for the U.S. and Canada, and then the U.K., Germany, and Sweden, not that far, uh, not that far behind. So we're really uh, uh, no longer uh, probably the world's richest country on average, and certainly people have not been doing better. And as I said, I think that goes a good ways toward explaining what's going on out there. So that's what's happened. Let me talk for a minute, and I'm not gonna obviously be able to go through all of this in great detail about what I think some of the causes and some of the uh, consequences and, uh, are of this. Um, I think there are really two things that drive the majority of what's going on out there, and I don't wanna oversimplify, but I wanna get through this in my lot of time. And those are basically technology and globalization. I'm gonna show you a slide or two on each of these to try to illustrate my points. And then I think there's a bunch of secondary causes. I'm sure there's more than what I've captured here. We can debate uh, which ones are more important. But things like the winner-take-all labor markets, tax policy, declining unionization, all those play a role. So let's start with technology. And I'm just going to illustrate that with a simple slide that shows what's happened to people's incomes based on their education level, going back to 1979, adjusting for inflation. So if you did not finish high school, uh, between 1979 and now, the average person in that cohort, their income would have gone down 24%. If you had high school, 11%, 10%, you can see these numbers, and college, you would be up. But actually, since 2000, even if you had a college degree, since 2000, your income would have gone down by about 2%. 
But the point is that education obviously matters, skills matter, and I think uh, it's a basic supply and demand of labor kind of argument plays a role in what's going on out there. Um, the second uh, major point I want to talk about is globalization. We can talk about free trade. I'm a free trader. We can debate free trade, but I don't think, I don't think, it's, uh, I don't think you can escape the fact that global competition has had an adverse impact on wages for many Americans. The country as a whole may well be better off. I would probably argue that it's better off, but there are individual winners and losers. And among the losers are workers who work in sectors that are globally competitive. And I put two of them at the bottom here, uh, manufacturing and autos, which is near and dear to my heart. And you can see that between 2000, uh, middle of 2009 and this spring, that real wages in, in these sectors have gone down, 2.7% in manufacturing, 10% in autos, and I can tell you lots of auto stories about where and how and why that's happening, but I know it's happening. And, and so that is something that we all have to live with and recognize. Let me turn to tax policy, which I mentioned before. This is a chart that essentially takes a bunch of different countries and graphs them, comparing what has happened to their top tax rates since 1960 and what has happened to the share of income that went to the top 1% since the 1960. So you can see the US and the UK all the way over on the left, which have had the largest reductions in marginal tax rates, have had the highest increase in inequality. And you can see Spain, Switzerland, Germany, which have had the smallest changes, no changes in these cases, in tax policy, in marginal tax rates, have had the smallest, in some cases actually uh, less inequality, changes in incomes uh, during the same 54-year, 52-year period. So there's clearly some relationship between taxes and income inequality. Another way to look at the same, uh, the same question is to compare incomes before and after the government gets in the middle of things. So basically before taxes, before social welfare programs, social security, all, food stamps, all these kind of programs and say, well, what's the impact of the government policy? So the light blue bars, and these are something called the Gini coefficient, for those of you who either know it or want to know it or don't, whatever. But <laughs> one, one is uh, the most unequal, zero is the most equal, and basically you then calculate where on a spectrum any country is. So the light blue bars are for each of these four countries before the government gets in the middle of things. The dark blue bars are after the government gets in the middle of things. And you can see that on a pre-government basis, the US is actually the least unequal of these four countries tied with Sweden and Britain and Germany are more unequal. But then you can see that post transfers, as we call it, the US ends up being the most unequal because all of our policies put together do less to reduce income inequality than all the policies of these other countries put together. And another way to illustrate this is the average tax rate paid by the wealthiest 400 Americans going back to 1992. And all you can see on here, I've put down the various tax, major tax changes that have occurred. The 1993 Clinton increases, the 1997 Clinton cuts, the Bush cuts, the Bush cuts. But all told, if you go back to the early 90s, these 400 people paid on average 29%. It got as low as 17% in 2007. Then it went back up to 20, not really because we changed tax policy, because of the recession. It's pro I'm almost surely, this is the most recent data I have, but almost surely it has come back down a bit since then, although taxes have also gone up a little bit, but so it's bumping along somewhere probably between 17 and 19 percent, much lower than it was uh, 20 years ago. So let me turn a little bit to some of the consequences of inequality. Um, one consequence that people believe, and I'm going to show you pros and cons on a couple of these, because I do think, to be fair and honest, there is, um, there is uncertainty about exactly um, what the consequences are and, and data that points in somewhat different directions. So this is something that Alan Kruger, former chairman of the Council of Economics, uh, Economic Advisors did. It's called, he calls it the Great Gatsby Curve. And it essentially plots income inequality across the bottom against uh, intergenerational mobility, against your chances of your kid moving up to the next, uh, the next level of income. And so as you can see, and then he drew a line through the middle, there appears to be a very close correlation uh, between in each country, between more, more unequal countries, less income mobility. And so the U.S. is shown here as having a very low level of income mobility, which is a fact, and, and, it, and it does uh, line up with these other countries. But there was another study done recently about <coughs> simply mobility within the U.S. And so going back to 1971, 
what is the chances of somebody bought, who's born into one of the five 20% slices of the pie moving up to the next one? And you can see these lines uh, are all basically flat. And what these researchers found is that while mobility in the US is less than it is in Europe, oddly enough, it actually hasn't changed much in the last 40 years, even though income inequality has gone up. So the next question I want to just talk about for a second is whether some people think more income inequality is bad for growth, some people think it's good for growth, and some people think it doesn't matter. So let me start with the IMF, which somewhat uncharacteristically, usually it sticks to things like budgets and fiscal austerity and whatnot, has weighed in on this subject. And they've produced a couple of uh, studies and a couple of charts that suggest that there is a relationship between more in income inequality and less growth. So this takes countries and it puts them, the more unequal ones on the right, and these tend to be lesser developed countries in Africa and Latin America and places like that, and it plots it against what it defines as kind of sustainable growth, the periods of time that a country can go before it has some kind of economic or financial crisis, and it does the kind of regression analysis, and lo and behold, it finds there is a relationship um, between the two. Um, and in another part of the study, it calculated that income distribution does play a major role in, in, again, how long growth persists, along with trade openness and the quality of political institutions, some of these other things playing less of a role. But here's another study from the OECD, which basically plots a bunch of countries comparing their growth of real GDP between 1994 and 2009 against the amount of income inequality uh, that the country has. And as you can see, there's really no pattern to this. And if you, think about it, uh, if you think about it, you can think of lots of examples. You can think of a, uh, a comparing France and Sweden, which both have low levels of income inequality. One of them is growing reasonably fast, one of them isn't. You can compare the US and Sweden. One of them has a lot of income inequality, one of them doesn't. They're both growing at a reasonably fast rate. So it's not completely obvious, uh, much as we might intuitively think so, that, uh, that there is that effect, but it's a debate that goes on. So let me talk for a second, and I'm just really going to tick these off about solutions. And I think, again, for those of you who've paid attention to this issue, these will probably mostly or all seem very familiar. I don't think there's a magic wand. I don't think there's a quick fix. It's not easy. It would take uh, a lot of things, including, uh, as Senator McCain said, you know, a Congress that was actually functioning. And so I don't, I don't have necessarily a great hope, but at least if I could wave a wand or, or lay out my agenda, it would include basically this group of, of five things and probably some others. Education and skills obviously being at the top. Uh, I, changes in tax policies, I've shown you the impact of that. Um, clearly spending on R&D infrastructure. I think we should be thinking more about uh, the ugly word of redistribution and actually um, recognizing that we're not going to change this overnight and government does have a role to play in taking more from those of us who've been fortunate and giving it to people who've been less fortunate. And then finally, I think we have to have an open conversation about trade and how we have free trade, but also have fair trade. So this is my last, uh, second to last slide. I want to end on an optimistic note, sort of an optimistic note, and show you one kind of interesting slide uh, that we found, which is that if you, if you basically looked at, uh, at the whole world as if it were one country, instead of all these different countries one by one, and you plotted it all on a, on a chart, here's what you would see. You would see that, that you've had uh, an enormous increase in incomes in the sort of rising middle class of the developing world. And that's the sort of optimistic uh, note that I was trying to refer to. But it really is very pervasive, and it spans, it spans uh, a, a vast number of people around the world. Um, you would also see what we talked about before, which is the decline of the middle class, uh, in the US particularly, but elsewhere as well and you would see the rise of this, uh, this global elite. So depending on which side of this chart you look at, um, you may come away from this feeling better or worse about everything I just said. So I'm going to stop there and let Van take over. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, I, I, uh, fast, fascinating stuff. I'm shocked, though, by what you said near the end. Are you suggesting that income inequality may not in fact hurt economic growth, may not in fact impact economic mobility? In which case, why is it a problem? Why isn't the answer just stop being jealous of successful people? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I am saying the first thing you said. I think, I think we all want to be whatever our 
uh, predispositions are, whatever our views of fairness, egalitarianism, the American dream, whatever you want to call it are, I think, you, I think we want to come at these, any issue, and I think this is very much in the spirit of New America, we want to come at these issues with an intellectually honest approach, look at all the data, yeah. and reach a conclusion. And what I wanted to show you, because I think the jury is out, I think the economist profession is, I don't want to say out to lunch, uh, is, <laughs> is, uh, you know, is still pondering this. And I don't think it's obvious. Uh, I don't think it's obvious that inequality affects growth one way or the other. Um, but, that, but the flip side of that is also true, which is if it doesn't affect growth that much, then one of the arguments that you hear a lot, which is, well, we really can't attack income inequality because that will reduce growth, also becomes wrong. Mm -hmm. It also then means you can, for social reasons, for fairness reasons, say, I want to deal with income inequality and not have to deal with the argument of, well, that's going to reduce our growth rate. So well, but, but let, let's talk about the mobility question. I think that's, that's the question that you know, middle class folks are most concerned about. And let's talk about something you didn't mention, which is, which is the minimum wage. It just seems to me to be mathematically impossible uh, that if you have an increase in income inequality with the middle class crashing, that that wouldn't do something bad to the mobility. I mean, how is it, I mean, explain to me how it's rationally possible to have uh, an increase in income inequality and not have an increase, at least in upward mobility. Well, I should get the two economists to come here and explain it to you because they did the study. But it, it's, look, it, it's, uh, a couple of things are true. It is true that we have <coughs> lower income mobility in this country than in Europe. We have had for a long time, actually, longer than any of us would even guess mm -hmm. at. What these guys found was that going back and, and looking at 40 years of families <laughs> and people, that it didn't, your chances of moving up or down didn't move that much. When you say the middle class is crashing, look, I'm as worried and upset about the middle class as you are. They haven't crashed. They just haven't gone up. And one of the things that I think has come out more and more as you look at this data is what I talked about, that the, that the real beneficiaries are this little sliver all the way up at the top. And so for many of the people around the middle, their relationship to each other hasn't changed that much. And therefore, it is possible mm. that their mobility hasn't changed that much. Okay, I'll throw a couple questions. If people want to ask, uh, I think we've got, you have a microphone? So maybe you start sig signaling. Um, a couple more questions. So today, while we're here, um, all across the country, uh, the fast food workers are demonstrating, they're striking, apparently one of the biggest strikes in American history. Um, uh, and that's tied to this concern about the minimum wage, which I don't think you mentioned at all. Is the minimum wage just not a big deal, just something for Democrats to beat up on? Well, I probably should have mentioned it uh, somewhere in there because it, it's, it's not a huge deal, but it's, it's an important deal. Uh, yeah, raising the minimum wage is certainly something we should do. I mean, you know the facts. It has been raised since 2009. It's now back at the levels in real terms it was in the 1960s. Uh, it's below other countries. Uh, I was at a conference recently where someone had sort of dissected what a hotel housekeeper gets paid in a bunch of different countries, Europe here, and it was really embarrassing, actually, at how we treat some of these people. So, yeah, it absolutely should be uh, raised. The reason I didn't mention it is that it's not going to, it's going to be, it's a, it'd be something very important to a group of people who are now at the bottom. Mm. It's not going to change the middle class, right? I mean, the minimum wage, we're talking about $10 an hour, that's $22,000 a year. <laughs> you know, middle class, median family incomes are about 50000 55000 so it's not going to help those people. Yeah, it's so. going to help the people at the bottom. Good. <clears throat> Just because in, in the news today, I thought it would be important to at least mention. Um, are there questions? Uh, let, let me just see where, where the mics are. You have a mic, and is there, are there two? Okay, so she, you have a mic. So we're gonna, we're gonna go this way and then this way. We'll just ping pong, okay. Thanks, I'm Marco Nunziato with General Electric, and as a disclosure, I am an economist. <laughs> I, my, my concern is we're a bit too quick at pointing the fingers at technology. So the numbers you've shown in terms of the returns to education and skills are important, they have important implications for education. However, you've also shown us numbers on the Gini coefficient, which show that uh, the US is not particularly unequal before taxes and transfers. So before the government gets involved with the redistribution policy. <coughs> and that suggests to me that it's not the impact of technology on wages which creates inequality. Also, you've pointed out that uh, Inequality and the rise in the share of wealth and income of the top 1% has been seen in the US, in English-speaking countries, US, New Zealand, Canada, UK, but not in countries like Germany, France, and Sweden. And I find it hard to believe that over the last 40 years we've seen significantly different technological progress in the US and New Zealand than in Germany. 
So how do you reconcile this? That's a good question. Look, on the first question, I think the answer to your first question is the fact is that, first of all, I'm actually, I'm actually probably a little less worried about technology than the average person who looks at this stuff. I think there's a, 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 there's a high level of terror in, uh, on the part of many people about the impact of technology, not just on wages, but on jobs and are we going to be replaced by robots and all that kind of stuff. And I'm actually, it's a separate discussion, I'm not as worried maybe as some others. But first, to your first point, um, to your first point, there's, this has happened, yes, technology is affecting all those countries and that's why you're seeing more inequality uh, in, in that's why the Gini coefficient is reasonably similar among those four countries because they're all, I think, facing the impact of technology in one form or another. We simply have, as you know, much more flexible labor markets, so wages here can move more rapidly uh, and go down. Uh, I don't think you're going to find a case in Europe where auto workers have taken 10% pay cuts to remain competitive. They just get government subsidies or whatever, or the companies lose money. And so uh, I think that the, impa the impact of technology is not that different on any of these countries. I think what's different is the way that the countries have organized themselves in terms of the government's involvement in, in protecting those at the bottom, helping those at the top, or whatever. Um, so that would be, I think that's my basic answer. Great. <coughs> so uh, I'm just going to point to you. you. You decide who you want to give the microphone to, but it's your mic's turn. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I promise I'm going to get you in, don't worry. Hi, Doug Olivant with New America Foundation. Uh, one thing you didn't discuss, I was surprised not to hear, was education costs and education policy. Um, your slides made it very clear that if you want your kids to be part of the next generation of the middle class, you absolutely must send them to school. Um, it strikes me that you have your 2.3 kids that you need to send. That's going to either put a big dent in the wealth, accumulated wealth at that point to the parents. So essentially, you're saving to send the kids to college, and when that's done, you can start saving for retirement, or you're just imposing that cost on the 21 to 25 year old, he then, he or she graduates with a 20, 30, $40,000 debt at that point, and he's not accumulating wealth then until he pays that back in his 30s. Um, I didn't see that on the slides. Is, is that something we need to talk about? Well, I only had 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and that honestly is the answer to your question. I, I agree with you completely, obviously, uh, that education is, and finding ways for people to pay for education, making it affordable, uh, is all at the top. And I will also now venture way out of my comfort zone, because I suspect there are a lot of people who know more about this than I do. But we should not only be, we shouldn't be talking just about how many kids get a four-year college degree, what kind of loans or subsidies, or how we help them financially, but we should also be talking about what kind of education they should get. Because it isn't obvious, uh, even for those of us who went to four-year liberal arts colleges uh, and might have studied philosophy, which I didn't, that that, that is what everybody should do. Um, you know, when, uh, when Volkswagen, I'll, well, I'll give you one anecdote and then we'll move on. When Volkswagen brought 2,000 new jobs to Chattanooga and there are a lot of interesting aspects to how that all happened, but one of the things that happened was, even though they had thousands and thousands of applicants, and those jobs paid $14.5 an hour when they started, they were not middle class jobs, they were lower middle class jobs. Even though they had all these applicants, they found the applicants really weren't capable of doing the work. And they ended up bringing trainers in from Germany to run German style training programs for them. So I think there's a, a lot to talk about between no education and, you know, and philosophy at Harvard um, that I think would be part of the conversation. Very good. Carol Heimowitz at Bloomberg. Um, I wonder how much of the solution has to come from the private sector, particularly boards of directors who've been so behind the run-up in executive pay. So you now have a situation where the top executives are getting about 300 times what the bottom, that there's been a balloon there. So I'll say something controversial on that. Um, I may not make many friends. I don't think it's the private sector's responsibility. I think you know we're all sort of, we're all set up to, and motivated by a set of incentives, a set of goals, a set of an assignment. We all have an assignment in life uh, of what we're supposed to do. And people in the private sector, executives, are supposed to run their companies and make money for their shareholders. I do think executive pay is out of control. Don't get me wrong. But I showed you there are 16,000 households in that top 0.01% with 7 million or more of income. There's only 500 companies in the Fortune 500. Uh, they're certainly part of the problem. I think it's out of control. I'd love to see some stuff done about it. Not probably by the government, but by the boards, as you say. It's, but it's more symbolic than actually going to really change uh, the numbers that I showed you. Well, well speaking of inequality, as we fi uh, figure out, uh, uh, 
Oh, good. You got me next. Okay, hang on. I got me, I'll be, me first. <laughs> me. You're in charge. You can have all the questions. <laughs> but they got the mic. Uh, speaking of out of control, the only people that I saw that should be super happy uh, were the people in the financial sector and, and the Wall Street folks. And uh, I'm just curious, what's your view about the financialization of the economy? It seems to me, if you ask your normal person, you go to a barber shop, you go to a bowling alley, you go to a sports bar, there's a view now that you've got some guys who are sitting around. Uh, they're mainly arguing about the length of the cord on their computer because their computer's doing a zillion tra uh, trades a second. And that those are the only people who are winning out and everybody else who's working, producing stuff is falling further, further and further behind. Um, is, 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 that your, uh, is, that, is that a fair view? Well, you know, asking me what I think about the financial sector is like asking a shoemaker whether people should have shoes. Um, you know, I <laughs> made my living in it for 40 years. Uh, uh, look, I so, think... So, so are, we, should, are, are you ripping us off? Am I ripping you off? <laughs> I'm doing my best, no. Um, uh, look, first of all, uh, I would say, in full disclosure, I didn't have, again, time for everything, that number is a little misleading because it's from a low point in 2009 you know, during the recession uh, upsets. But there's no question the financial sector is doing, uh, is doing fine. Look, I, I, I would, I'll, so I'll say something else controversial and then I'll temper it a little bit. Uh, I think if you say to yourselves, well, how are we going to compete around the world? You know, how are we going to, we can't, if we can't, uh, if we're going to have to cut auto workers' wages to be competitive, well, how are we going to compete? And we have to remember we are very competitive in a bunch of industries, whether it's information technology or healthcare or education and financial services. And if you look around the world, our banks and our financial services firms are the most successful ones in the world. And I don't think we want to give that up. Um, I think, and Tim Geithner's book is also out uh, this week, and it's a great book. I recommend it to all of you because I think he lays out how they thought about this. And it, it was a Hobson's choice. And, and, I, and I think Tim would be the first to say that in the course of saving the country and saving the financial system, um, there were beneficiaries of that, shall we say, who, that were unfortunate. And I think if we could do it all over again, if we could change life, um, you might do it a little differently. And I also think that uh, going forward, uh, we need a much more vigorous regulatory apparatus and, and oversight apparatus to keep things under control. But I don't think, I don't think our, our capital markets and the amount of, uh, the ability of companies here, young companies to raise uh, venture capital and things like that, I just don't think we want to, I don't think we want to cut off our noses to spite our faces, honestly. Well said. Here. Hi, my name is Sarah Ann Lee with the U.S. Department of Education, and I'm really interested in one of the solutions you suggested, which was redistribution. But a challenge that we find is that even if you have an educated group that don't know about money, they haven't had money introduced into their realm of thinking, they don't know how to properly invest, they get caught up in wicked, wizardly economic schemes, and they can't navigate themselves out of poverty or tricky student loans. So how does the redistribution address people who don't know how to manage the money, even if they do get it? Well, that's a really good point. Again, a little bit out of my assignment for today, but uh, but it, there's no question that the lack uh, that 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 the lack of financial literacy on the part of people is a major impediment in all this. Uh, uh, as I guess a little bit of an aside, but it relates to your point. I, I mean, personally, I think that the change from defined benefit <coughs> pension programs, where the money was invested by big pension funds and you got a pension, to the 401k IRA system, which was done for for reasons unrelated, I think is actually was a really bad policy decision because it basically told people you got to now deal with your money and people don't know how to deal with their money. They're, they're not professionals. You wouldn't take out your appendix. You wouldn't write your own will. You wouldn't fix your own plumbing. Why would you try to manage your own money? So that's one piece of it that I think um, needs to be fixed. But I do, yeah, I had, uh, I had uh, lunch with somebody the other day who wants to really take a lot of his uh, wealth and, and make a big push for financial literacy because he agrees with you and I agree with you. That it's uh, something that should be on the list. Well, we only have one more minute, but I cannot ignore that hand right there. So please give that uh, great leader the microphone. Thank you, Van. Thank you, Stephen. By the way, I admit I, I did major in philosophy in college. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I want to drill in on one of your f uh, five solution tracks was tax policy. It, it's always troubled me that mo most American families pay more in payroll taxes than in income taxes, and payroll taxes are the most regressive forms of taxes by definition. And could that, could that not be a winning um, political formula to focus in on lowering payroll taxes? Because Americans are averse to redistribution. That doesn't fly here. But the message that working Americans should be able to keep more of the gains of their own work might just resonate. And um, you know, we could, we could uh, fund our social security system through progressive income taxation instead. Your comments, please. 
So I think, I, I, you know, to those of us in the money business, it's all just money, and you can call it what you want. And, and I totally agree with the implication of your question that whatever solution those of us who want to do something come up with should make it as politically palatable as we can because redistribution is an ugly word and it's not a word that has a lot of great political resonance. Um, at the moment, the country, or at the moment, the conventional wisdom is still centers around the idea of a social security trust fund and that people pay in and they get out and all that stuff even though, even though the uh, actuarial numbers aren't, don't really work. And so it would take a big change in our thinking. I'd be fine with that. Uh, another thing that would really also mostly help people at the very bottom, but which I think a, a vast number of uh, economist types believe in is raising the earned income tax credit. It's a very, uh, it's a very progressive, very uh, efficient way to help people who are closer to the bottom. So there's a thousand ideas out there, and I'm not in the packaging business, but I'm, I'm fine with that one. I'm fine with pretty much anything. I just think we're heading in the wrong direction. Well, well, listen, I think we are out of time. Is that right? So I, I want to uh, give you a big round of applause for your thinking on this Thank stuff. And <laughs> it does seem like this is an idea whose time has come. So. Nice to see you. It's good, man.